Please be seated. You receive invitations all the time. How do you decide whether or not to accept an invitation? Scripture is filled with heartfelt invitations from God to you. He invites those who are exhausted, curious, searching, or in need to find what we need most in Him. Will you accept the invitation? We are starting a new sermon series today called You're Invited. I don't know about you, but I get lots of invitations. Some in the mail, some by phone, some by text, maybe email, maybe in person. Some are more formal, like an invitation to a wedding or maybe some parties. Some are very casual and informal, like, hey, you want to grab lunch today? That's an invitation as well. There are all kinds of invitations, and we have to decide whether or not we will accept the invitation that we receive. Whatever the invitation, we have to decide, am I going to do this? Am I going to go there? Am I going to join them? And, and I don't know about you, but I have some guidelines, and you probably do too, when you are invited somewhere or to be a part of something. You probably consider who it is that's doing the inviting. Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Is it a coworker? Is it someone you're trying to impress? Is it a girl you like? You know, who is inviting and, and how close are you to that person? What kind of relationship do you have? Uh, probably you also consider what it is that you're invited to do or where you're invited to be, the nature of the event or the nature of the occasion that you're being invited to. Is that something that you want to do? Is it something that you like to do? Is it something that you've always wanted to do or just something that, eh, maybe I'll do it? And then you probably also look at your schedule and think, can I do it? Can I fit it into my schedule? Am I busy? Do I have something else going on? And so there are probably lots of factors that come into play when someone extends an invitation to you and you have to decide whether or not you're going to accept that invitation. It seems recently I have been getting a lot of invitations in the mail. Invitations not just to weddings and other things like that. That's great. But invitations to change my insurance company or invitation to take out a loan with a company or an invitation to go and listen to a very brief presentation, a very brief presentation that will either save me millions or make me millions. And so sometimes I see these invitations in my mailbox and I look at them and man, that, you know, this is this is a nice envelope. It's like cardstock. It's fancy stuff. Maybe some gold embossed letters. You're invited. And then I look more closely and it says, to Randy Roper or current resident. And I think, I thought, I thought they cared about me. I thought this was personal. What they're saying is, Randy, we want you to come, but if you don't live there, you can't come. Anybody with a pulse who lives at that address, let them come. That's fine. So I usually just throw those right in the trash. I don't even, don't even open them. If they say, or current resident, I just throw it right in the trash. Well, the Bible is full of invitations from God to you. All kinds of invitations. And some of them are very direct, very straightforward. When Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It is a very easily understood invitation. But there are some invitations that are a little bit more subtle, you might say. Seeing Jesus eat with people that society said were sinners, and then Jesus being judged for that and criticized for that, and Jesus saying, wait, do the healthy need a doctor? I have come to seek and to save the lost. And embedded in that narrative is an invitation to all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter how bad we think our past is, to have a place at the table with Jesus. Jesus fellowships with us. He invites us into relationship with him. Some of the invitations in scripture are what we might consider directives or commands. And yet, even when God commands something, he doesn't force us, does he? He doesn't strong arm us. He doesn't coerce us. You see, that's the nature of freedom. That's the nature of love. It doesn't force. And yet, Jesus and God throughout Scripture make appeals to us, pleas to us, invitations to us. And so here's the question. How do you decide whether or not you accept an invitation from God? How do you decide whether you say, yes, God, I received this invitation, and I'm with you. 
Count me in. I will be there. Here's my RSVP. I'm in. You probably have some of the same factors that come into play. Who is it that's doing the inviting? Well, it's God. Well, how close do I feel to God? How closely connected am I to God? What is the nature of my relationship with God? Or maybe it's, what is it exactly he's inviting me to do or to be or to take part in? Is that something that I want to do? Is that something that appeals to me? And then also, well, let me check my schedule, God. I'm a pretty busy person. I got got a lot of things going on, so let me see if I can fit prayer into my schedule. Let me see if I can fit whatever you're inviting me to into my plan. When Jesus says, Take up your cross and come and follow me. It is an invitation to die to self. And we're going to talk about that one later in the series. An invitation to die to self. And how many times do we look at our calendars and look at our schedules and go, well, yeah, I'm pretty busy today. Tomorrow I can't die to self. The next day, yeah. God, I pretty much have no room to die to self because I'm too busy living for self. So I want you to wrestle throughout this series with how do you decide whether or not you accept an invitation from God? The nature of the invitation, the one who's making the invitation, your schedule, your priorities. And one of the purposes of this series we're calling You're Invited is for you to see where God wants you to be and how God wants you to be and for that matter who God wants you to be. Some of the invitations we will look at They will confront you. Others will comfort you. Some will challenge you, and some, I hope, will affirm and validate you. But all of them will invite you into a closer walk with Christ. Will you accept God's invitation? Like we do every time we start a sermon series, we have our Discovery Bible Study bookmarks. The uh, actual bookmarks are out in the lobby. You can grab those. It's also online, a PDF version. If you want to read along with this sermon series, either before or after each sermon, or even better than that, if you want to open up God's Word with someone and use the text that we're using for this series to go through these very simple yet deeply profound questions about who God is and who we are and what the message, the truth of Scripture is for our lives. I would encourage you to do that. Maybe someone in your family, someone in your home, someone in your Bible class, maybe someone at work, maybe a neighbor. Invite them to open up God's Word and use that as a wonderful resource and tool for that to happen. Our first invitation that we're going to look at in this series, you might call it a double invitation or a reverse invitation or a double reverse invitation. Solomon has built the temple. It's time for God to inhabit the temple of God. And so he invites God into the temple, and God comes into the temple, and yet he also has an invitation for Solomon and his people. If you have a Bible, you might look at 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 6, chapter 7. We're going to be in chapter 6 and chapter 7. 2 Chronicles, it's in the Old Testament. It's around the 12th or 13th book in your Bible if you're somewhat new to the Bible, or you can just scroll on your device until you get to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Sometimes it's helpful to have the text there in front of you because we won't be able to cover every single verse. Solomon, as I said, has built this grand and glorious temple in Jerusalem for God. It was the vision of his father and the predecessor of himself as king of Israel, David, But God allowed Solomon to build this temple, and so Solomon has finished the temple. This is going to be a place where God will dwell among his people. This temple is going to be the intersection between heaven and earth, a place where people can come and make sacrifices and offerings to God and worship to God, a place where they can encounter a holy God. It is going to be the house of God. Of God. And so Solomon is dedicating the temple to the name of the Lord and inviting God into the temple. To do that, he gathers the people, especially the leaders of the Israelite nation, and he dedicates the temple. We're going to pick it up in chapter 6, verse 4. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hands has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth. By the way, notice all of the different body parts 
that are talked about when it comes to God, who has done this with his hands, fulfilled what he's promised with his mouth to my father David. For he said, since the day I brought my people out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city in any tribe of Israel to have a temple built so that my name might be there, nor have I chosen anyone to be ruler over my people Israel. But now I have chosen Jerusalem for my name to be there, and I have chosen David to rule my people Israel. Solomon says, God, your house, the one that you've been looking forward to, the one that you worked through David to plant this seed, this idea that really came in many ways from David, it has been completed. And it's time for you to dwell among your people. This is going to be a house dedicated to your name, Solomon says. That word name is used time and time again in this text. In verses 4 through 11, I know you probably can't read that text. There's not a chance I can read that with my eyes. But maybe you can at least see the yellow words there. See how many times God's name or the name of God is used there. That is significant, I think. You see, a good name gives credibility to something. That's why companies will give millions of dollars to well-known people and celebrities and athletes to use their name, to borrow their name, to put their name on their product or service. A good name means something. This is going to be the house that belongs to Yahweh God. His name will be on the door. It's his house. Names are also very personal, aren't they? This is God's house. It belongs to him. This isn't for any current resident. This is personal. This is for God himself. And God wants this personal connection with his people, just as Solomon and Israel want a personal connection with God. God desires that with his people. So Solomon says, this temple is for your name. Not just any deity, not just any God, the one and only God, your name, the name that is above all names. I think name is also used here as an extension of God, of God's character. God himself, obviously, is not going to pull up in a U-Haul next to the temple and start unloading boxes into the temple. He's not literally moving into the temple. Now, for the pagan temples around them, that's what people believed, that those deities actually lived in those structures. But even Solomon himself in chapter 2 says this, and he's about to say it again in chapter 6 in his prayer to God. He says, not even the highest heavens can contain you, Lord. So I know this house, this structure, this earthly building can't contain you, but will you look favorably upon it and upon us as we make sacrifices to you and to your name? And so in many ways, the name of God was an extension of, of God, symbolic of God's presence among his people. Solomon has the leaders. He has the people gathered up. He's dedicating the temple for the name of the Lord. And he has this special platform built. And on this platform, he kneels down and he lifts his hands to the heavens and he prays. Look at verse 14. This is how he begins his prayer. Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your ways. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, and with your hand you have fulfilled it, as it is today. That's dedication language. Solomon says, this belongs to you. You're the one and the only God. We submit to you. This is your house. As I said, Solomon goes on to acknowledge that no physical structure can contain God, but would he look with his eyes, another body part, upon the people and upon their sacrifices, would he hear with his ears their prayers, their offerings, and would his heart be with his people? And then Solomon in this prayer gives specific scenarios of what the people will do, the, the Israelite people, the nation of Israel, what they will do is they keep the covenant with God. And then in turn, what their expectation or hope or desire is that God will do to keep this covenant. And so much of the prayer is covenant language, talking about the two different parties. And then he closes the prayer with an invitation 
to God. Every good sermon ends with an invitation, right? Solomon ends his prayer with an invitation to God, verse 41. Now arise, Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might, the ark of the covenant. May your priests, Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your faithful people rejoice in your goodness. And when Solomon says amen, fire rains down from heaven and consumes the burnt offering consumes the sacrifices. The glory of the Lord fills the space. Now, God may not have pulled up in a U-Haul and unloaded boxes, but he is making his name known. He is making his presence felt among his people. How do they respond? They fall on their faces and they worship God, declaring God is good. His love endures forever. Well, a couple of weeks of dedicating the temple go by, and finally Solomon sends the people back home. Their hearts are filled with joy and the sense of resolve. Remember the covenant language? God, here's what we're going to do. We're going to be faithful to you as you dwell among us. We're going to live in relationship with you, and so we're going to do what we said we will do. They go home with all this sense of resolve and this joy because God has inhabited the temple. He is dwelling among them. The presence of God is there. Now, up until this point, Solomon is doing most of the talking, and he extends this invitation to God to make his presence known, to fill the temple. Remember I said this was a reverse invitation or a double invitation or a double reverse invitation? Now it's time for God to speak, and God has an invitation of his own for Solomon, his expectations for Solomon as a leader of the people, and an invitation for the people what he expects of them, this, this plea, this appeal, this invitation, this calling. Back in our text, chapter 7, verse 12, much of the text that was read just a few moments ago, God says, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. This is very personal for God. God responds to Solomon's prayer. And God says, yes, my eyes will look upon upon the people and their sacrifices and their offerings with favor. My ears will hear their prayer. Those who are called by my name will make these offerings and I will approve. But that's not where it stops. Basically, what God is saying is what happens in this temple is people make sacrifices and offerings. That is great, and I will look upon that with favor, but that's not enough. What God is saying is what Paul would say centuries later in Romans 12, verse 1, when he talks about our spiritual act of worship and service. If you know that verse, you know what he says. He says, offer what? Your bodies. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. God says to Solomon and his people, that's great that you're going to make sacrifices in my house, but I want more. I want your lives to be a sacrifice. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean you want our lives to be a sacrifice? Well, he tells us. Verse 14, that well-known scripture Look at it again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them and I will restore, I will heal their land. That's the oath. That's the covenant language. That's the invitation for God's people, Israel, led by Solomon. You've probably heard that passage before. I gotta tell you, I've heard this passage plucked 
out of its original context and applied to a modern day nation such as the US. And it makes sense that many of us would look around our society, we'd look around our nation today and we'd see the chaos and we'd see the conflict and we'd see so much that seems so much against what God desires and we would stand up and say, if this nation would just humble itself and pray and seek the Lord's face and turn from its wicked ways, then God would restore our land. He would remove the plague. He would remove hardship. He would bless us as a nation. And I understand that sentiment. And in many ways, on many levels, there is truth there, but I need to make some observations about using that verse to apply to a nation today such as the United States. The first observation is this. The U.S. is not in a covenant relationship with God like Israel was with God when these words were spoken. Has God blessed this nation, this wonderful nation in which we live? Absolutely. And we should be thankful. But we do not live in a covenant relationship with God as Israel did. And so we must be careful about making parallels with anything we read about Israel and God to the U.S. and God. And we must be careful about making deals for God that God has not made for himself and us. The second observation is this. And please hear me. Hear me well. So often when I hear something like this used, it is accompanied with this desire to go back. To go back to the good old days. To go back to our Christian roots. To go back and restore the Christian foundation on which this nation was built. And I understand that. And I, for one, like you, I'm sure, am so thankful for the religious freedom on which our nation was established, that we don't have a national religion that we must conform to. That is a blessing. And I'm thankful for the call to Christian ethics that is in our history and Christian morals and values that is in our history. But let's not be deceived about our past because with our Christian roots, there was not perfection our Christian foundation as a nation has some cracks in it, some major cracks in it. For example, the mistreatment and the oppression of other people, namely slavery. And people who were doing this, some of our forefathers, some who wore the name Christian, were doing these things and sometimes even justifying it with Scripture mistreatment of others, the oppression of others in any form does not represent the heart of Christ. It does not represent the values of the kingdom of God. And so rather than looking back and wanting this idealized version of our history to be restored, why don't we look forward? Why don't we look forward to something better, something different? Why don't we learn from our past and be thankful for the good things, but learn from the past, and let's talk about the future. And let's talk about what God can do and will do. And let's talk about a nation or a family or a congregation or a community or an organization that more closely represents the heart of Christ and the values of the kingdom moving toward the kingdom of heaven. The third observation I would make is that quite often when we, and this is an example, I should say me, when I say something like this, what we need to do, what our nation needs to do, what our leaders need to do, what I'm saying is I'm going to sit over here on the sidelines because I can't do much, and so here's what y'all need to do. Here's what they need to do. So often the call to confession, the call to turn, the call to seek God is something that we put on other people and not ourselves first. This call to confession starts right here. It starts in the mirror. Not this is what so-and-so needs to do. This is what our politicians and our government leaders and our president, all of that may have truth in it. But it must start right here with me. It must start with you. Which leads to the final observation about this. 
As much as you and I think that our nation needs to humble itself before God, who do we expect is going to do that? Why do we expect government leaders necessarily to do that? The religious freedom that we enjoy, that we're thankful for, it's that same religious freedom that gives us a great diversity of thought and belief. And when you have a great diversity of thought and belief, that means not everyone thinks the same way or believes the same way, which means we can't assume that our nation's leaders or our city's leaders or our state's leaders necessarily believe what we believe or believe what you believe or represent the values of God's kingdom or the heart of Christ, even sometimes when they say they do. So why would we expect, why would we assume for a spiritual revolution to be started by and led by people who may or may not subscribe to the values of God's true kingdom. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Why would we sit on the sidelines and wait for someone else to do something when that's not even on someone else's agenda? Oh, they may have the sound bites. They may wear the name. But why would we assume they would do that? Maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a different way. Did you see what that verse said? The people who were called by his name. A future where the name of Jesus reigns in our homes, in our communities, in our churches, in our workplaces, even in our nation, will not necessarily happen prompted by a government, a secular government even. A spiritual revolution like that will only occur when the people of God who are called by God, by the name of God, and called out by the name of God. That's what that word ecclesia, church, means, the called out. Only when we, you and I, rise up by lowering ourselves and humbling ourselves and seeking the face of God will change really happen. It starts with me. It starts with you. The ones who declare the name of Christ. So let's look back at that verse again. Verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, I will hear them. I will hear you and I will heal your land. That is an invitation. And while it's not a formula for getting God's good favor, and it's not a timeless promise for our nation or any other nation today, it is an invitation. It is an appeal. One that is echoed throughout Scripture that is relevant today for us and will be relevant for the rest of our days. This invitation, God invites you to humble yourself, to pray, to seek his face, and turn from sin. That's the invitation. And it takes genuine humility to do that, doesn't it? It really does. First of all, we have to recognize our wicked ways. Can we find a different way to say that? Can we find a different translation that doesn't sound so gritty? Wicked ways? That's not me. It takes humility to acknowledge that some of our ways are wicked, <laughs> that we have a sin problem. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, not those who walk around and say, look at how much I am and how much I have and how good I am. No, blessed are those who know they are spiritually bankrupt without Jesus. James 5, 16 tells us to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When is the last time you confessed sin? And I don't just mean walking down up here during the invitation song. I mean, that's a good question. For many of us, the answer is never or a long, long time ago when I was a kid at camp, right? I mean, when have you confessed sin to anyone? When have you admitted wrongdoing to anyone? When have you confessed to God? We don't like to confess because it acknowledges that we don't have it all together, that we struggle, that we do have wicked ways. 
There are so many things that keep us from not only turning from our wicked ways, but even acknowledging our sin. The embarrassment that comes with that, the shame that we anticipate, the pride that we have to let loose of to confess sin. I don't want to admit that I've sinned. I haven't been watching much of the NBA, the basketball playoffs. I've been watching a little bit, but I'm not that interested. You know, I'm waiting on the thunder. They're kind of waiting in the wings, rebuilding, right? Positioning themselves to to be a player soon. But I've watched a little bit of it, and I, I didn't realize there's a rule now that every coach gets one challenge per basketball game. So if there's a foul called or a, another violation called, the coach can say, I want to challenge that. And they'll go to the videos, and they'll look at it again, and they'll say, oh, yeah, it was, or no, we were wrong, and, you know, you get the ball or whatever. And so I've noticed a couple of times as I've watched a little bit of some of these games, this has happened more than once, that a foul will be called on a player. When the foul is called on the player, you get this overreaction of, I didn't foul him. You know, every player, they never foul. They never admit that they foul. I didn't foul him. There's no way I made contact with him. And what do they do? They go over to their coach, and they point to the screen, and they say, you need to challenge that. There's, I didn't foul him. And sometimes, for whatever reason, the coach listens to the player. You didn't foul him? Okay, I'm sure you, you never foul anybody. Let's challenge that. And the coach will challenge it. And so they'll stop the game. The referees will go over to the monitors, and they'll look at it, and they'll put their headphones on. They're talking to somebody. I don't know who they're talking to. They're talking to somebody. They're watching the monitor. And while they're doing that, they're showing the replay at home, and you, look, you get to watch it. And you say, yeah, there it is. He hit his hand right there. Clearly, he made contact. So the referees come back after watching the monitors, and they say, yep, it was a foul. Guy gets to shoot free throws, let's move on. And I always wonder, what's the coach think in that moment? I want, to, I want them to show the coach's face right when the refs say that. And I want him to look at that player. You know, he's going, why did I listen to you? We all knew that was a foul. And I think sometimes that's how we are with sin. I didn't sin. I'm above sin. I don't sin. You know, challenge that. If someone, if someone says, to you that, that you did or said something that hurt them? What's your first reaction? Mine is to defend myself. Well, either I didn't do that or I didn't mean that or, you know, you must have some mistake. Let's go to the tape and let's look and see. Let's review that. Or if the Holy Spirit begins to convict you that there is sin in your life, it's so easy just to brush it off and ignore it, isn't it? Eh, that's, that's, not, that's not serious. That's not me. That wasn't a foul. God says, turn from your wicked ways. Before you can turn from your wicked ways, you have to acknowledge your wicked ways. But it's not just acknowledge, it is turn, and that is repentance. Maybe you've heard before that repentance means not just a change of mind, it means a change of heart and a change of direction. Repentance says, here's what I'm doing, and God, I'm really sorry for it, but now I'm moving this way instead of that way. I am turning away from that sin. By the power of the Holy Spirit in me, I'm going to move away from that sin. That's repentance. True repentance is change. That's what it means to turn from your wicked ways. Paul said in Acts 26, verse 20, that repentance is demonstrated by our words. Is that what he says? God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I did that. That's that's needed. Confession is needed. But what does Paul say? He said it's demonstrated. Repentance, true repentance, is demonstrated by our deeds, by our actions. Turn from your wicked ways. So let's wrap up. Here's the invitation. Let's just boil it down. God invites you to seek his face. Do you remember all the personal language used? God's eyes, his ears, his heart, his hands, his face, personal language. That's not by accident. What God says is, I want to have an intimate personal relationship with you. To seek the face of God means to know God and be known by God. Isn't that an invitation worth accepting? To know God and be known by God? Just as his name is used in Scripture as an extension of himself, of his character, his face is used as an extension of his heart, 
of his character, of his love. And that's why in the priestly prayer of Numbers 6, the prayer is, may he turn his face toward you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. It's a very personal connection that God wants. Last week I had to uh, use Zoom, you know, on the computer. I haven't done that in a long time. Y'all remember Zoom? Wait, if you're like me, when I saw this screen, I started like getting cold sweats and anxiety because it had been so long since I've had to use Zoom. I thought, oh man. Y'all remember Zoom or whatever you used for your meetings at work and connecting with people all over the world and maybe family gatherings and special occasions and conversations and we all had faces on our screens, right? And, And that worked. I mean, it was fine. We adapted and we made do, but it wasn't the same, was it? There was always just kind of not a deep connection there. And you know, you're having a meeting and someone's trying to talk and someone butts in and there's a, there's a lag and you can't, you're like, okay, you go, I go, you know, and then someone's asleep on this corner of your screen and someone over here is playing with their background and changing it the whole time and just didn't have a strong connection with people. You see, there's a difference between seeing a face and seeking a face. And so many times we are content with just seeing the face of God. And we come to church and we get glimpses of God's face. And we have the warm fuzzies and we leave and we're ready to go. But don't be content just to see the face of God. He invites you to seek his face. To live in this close, intimate relationship with him. And that starts with humbling yourself and praying and turning from your wicked ways. That's God's invitation for you, for me, today, and every day. How do you decide whether you accept that invitation? How will you decide today? If you need to accept an invitation, and that means doing something publicly or privately, please do that. Don't dismiss or ignore the prompting of the Spirit of God. In just a minute, a couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor. It's a room right behind me. You can go there. They'll encourage you and pray for you, or you can come down to the front. And we will encourage you and pray for you. Maybe you need to confess sin. Maybe to this group, maybe to someone in a very personal relationship, conversation later. Please do that. Maybe today you're ready to give your life to Christ. First service, a young man was baptized and we celebrate with him. We would love to do that with you this morning. If you want to be baptized, please let that be known. If there's something we can do, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Just as I